it's very easy to accept a narrative about the Bible that's convenient for the lifestyle that you want to live. And Jesus is, is anything but convenient for your lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Welcome to the Belfast Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Byler. This week's going to be part two of Daniel and I's discussion on the canonization of the New Testament. Last week was part one. We discussed the gospel, can, the canonization of the gospels. This week we moved on to the apostolic letters. We have a discussion about what it means to author these letters, who the authorship is attributed to in the letters themselves. I bring up some modern examples of this. I believe we also have a discussion about the dates of the books in the New Testament from Heiser, which I think is essential for Christians to know to combat a lot of myths that revolve around how the New Testament canon came to be. And then you can look forward to part three next week. We have a very specific side tangent discussion, but I think it's very beneficial about canonization itself. So look forward to that one. As always, thank you guys very much for listening. You can always, if you like what we're doing here, leave us a rate, review on iTunes, subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment. You can email me at BelfastPodcast.gmail.com. You can follow us at the Belfast Podcast on Instagram and DM Daniel there. We always love hearing from you guys. Always love seeing how you found out about us, um, what's going on in your lives, what led you to, you know, doing to become a part of this community here. Um it is just so, so encouraging. Uh, I hope that we keep producing stuff that is edifying and beneficial and helps not only change your mind, but your heart and your actions in your Christian life, helps reawaken your imagination. So thank you guys very much for listening, and as always, we'll see you in the next one. I almost said Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah. You know, in the trailer, do you, he has the post credits. Yeah. Like, dude, it's yeah. all over. It's just different things. Yeah. 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 G- great, great example. Wait, so over 15 years now, over half the time period of the gap that we're talking about, my wife and I have done this. Are the odds are that I'm just going to be like, well, remember, I was riding a stallion, you know, and, I was, <laughs> and she'll just be like, you're an idiot, you know, like what, do you guys get what I'm talking about here? We're ta- we have the, the people who were there for the events who have been telling and retelling and retelling the events of the most important events of their lives. And, and the, it's they become their job to do this because they travel around and they do it for a living because they want everybody to know how amazing Jesus of Nazareth was. And so these stories that get written down, these eyewitness accounts that have a fixed oral form, a, a gospel author like Luke does his research, he goes and investigates people, and then just like Moses or Jeremiah sitting at the table with all the scraps, he prays, he goes to work that day, and he arranges the story of Jesus into the Gospel of Luke, as you and I, it's a divine and human word about the story, should I do it again, about the story of what God is in the terms of the covenant and so on. How you guys doing? Okay, let's keep going. Um, the apostolic letters. So at the end of Matthew, Jesus commissioned, right, that circle of apostles, and he, what did he commission them to do? To go out, invite everybody into the covenant family, tell the story, and then to Uh, convey my teachings, what it means to live according to the terms of the covenant as a follower of Jesus. And so uh, right after the four accounts of Jesus are the apostolic letters of of the New Testament. There's a collection of letters by Paul, and then there's a collection of letters by the other key figures, Peter, John, and so on. You guys with me here? It's the letters of the New Testament. Now Paul was uh, one of the first additions onto the team. Judas dropped out, right? So you went from 12 to 11. And then Paul, not, not without a period of discernment, was added to that circle because he had made it his life goal to kill as many followers of Jesus as he could, right? And then all of a sudden he met the risen Jesus and it scared him to death, 
right? And it, all of a sudden, he's, he becomes a part of this circle. So they're writing letters. What are these letters about? These letters, are uh, uh, they bear witness to the growing family of followers of Jesus. And so they're writing to Jesus' followers in Rome, all these places. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, right? The movement is spreading into all the nations. And so Paul and what these apostles are doing, they, they're not just repeating the stories and the teachings of Jesus, the gospels, you know, are, and those stories are already out there. What they do is they give greater discernment and greater guidance. So you have Christians in Rome and the church is split between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. And there's all these like cultural conflicts happening between them. And so what does Paul do? He takes Jesus' great command, love God, love your neighbor. He takes the great covenant story of Abraham who has become a father and a blessing to all nations. And he applies the teachings of Jesus and the story of the Bible to help this community resolve its conflicts so they can become the light to that city and realm that Jesus wants them to be. Do you see that there? That's what each of these apostolic letters does. It's addressed to a real community and it applies the story of Jesus and the truth and, and the whole story of the Bible to the problems that this community was facing. And so it's wonderful for us because we actually get all of these test cases of the apostles doing what Jesus asked them to do. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in a Jesus community too. And my hunch is that that's full of other people who are in that community that, you know, they're like your weird uncle. You know, you're supposed to like them, but really you don't. You know? <laughs> and they sing different songs than you and they dress differently than you. And Jesus says that you're supposed to love them more than you love yourself. How are you gonna do that? Lucky for us, we have the writings of the apostles <laughs> who they're helping the early Christians sort this out. So who wrote these letters? I think that's also a key point to focus on for just a second. The letters in the New Testament aren't supposed to say anything new. They're not supposed to say anything systematically or overarchingly, right? They're supposed to help certain people in certain times and places take the principles that Jesus established and apply them to their community settings. And I think that's a fundamental shift in the way that we've traditionally approached the letters for a very long time. All right? I can't remember who said it, but we've, it's the quote, um, we've made Jesus our God and Paul our Lord, right? And instead, I think what's more appropriate is to picture it as making Jesus our God and Lord and Paul his apostle, his sent one, his messenger, and his community builder. Because that's really what Paul's doing. Mm -hmm. is he's building communities and then trying to help them stay together as communities. Yeah. And the other thing within that that is really important is to remember that whenever we're reading the letters, we are literally reading someone else's mail. And so, so to act like that isn't the case is weird. Now they've become scripture whatever that means. Um, it's not nothing. It's definitely something. But again, time and place. To act as if now, there, there are certain instances, I'm just thinking of things my New Testament professor would, would say. There are instances in, say, Corinthians and Galatians, where Paul will say things about them that also would apply to all the churches, phrases of this nature, as in all the churches of the Lord, or as in all communities, right, act in such a way that this, that, and the other. And I would never argue that the principles or 
covenantal actions Paul is calling a certain community to only applies to them and never applies to anybody else. Oh, absolutely. With that being said, the ways in which Paul argues for the implementation of those things is important to understand in the communal setting. Well, and uh, Tim will say this later, and we may or may not skip this, this section, but um, he talks about in Colossians how Paul instructs the people of Colossae in, in the church of Colossae to read the letter that Paul sent to Laodicea mm -hmm. and share the letter he sent to them with the church mm -hmm. in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And so Paul is writing these in a way that they're supposed to, these letters are supposed to be informing for people beyond just the people he's writing to. Mm -hmm. But I think the people he's writing to and those, that larger community understands to a degree that he was writing to a about a specific issue in a specific time and in a specific mm -hmm. place right and we should not assume then that we can copy and paste the same solution or try to construct a systematic theology necessarily across letters without taking into account those aspects of the letter itself that are less explicit, right? Um, the, the most relevant example, not only just to the church, but also to me, because I just spent an entire semester in this book, is Romans. We've created a systematic theology out of Romans that is completely ignorant of the fact that Paul is writing to a church that's split between Jews and Gentiles who are arguing about the way they function together in community. And what we've done is we've made it about predestination or free will and um, salvation, penal sal substitution, salvation, penal substitu uh, sub substitutionary atonement. I don't know why that was so hard to say. Penal substitutionary atonement, um, the way we get saved, um, who is and isn't saved. And all of these things. The road to salvation. Yeah, the Romans road. The Romans road doesn't exist, right? So the, the, within the book of Romans, it's mainly about who is in and who is out of community and why. It's not necessarily about who is in and who is out of heaven and why. Mm -hmm. And Paul uses the example, excuse me, of... Um, vessels for destruction and vessels for salvation, not as the point of this is the way things work, but as an example of, okay, you're saying right now that the Jews have lost the plot of the story, and therefore you are the primary means of Gentiles or the primary means of God effectuating his plan in the world. And Paul even says, like, I'll grant you that. But don't assume that you as a grafted in branch will not be cut off if you become proud, right? It's conditional, even in the context of that letter, right? And it's based on their status of faith. So it's not this like, oh, predestined and you can't lose your salvation and, you, and nothing that like God is sovereignly imposing it upon you. No, it's God has a plan and God's working that plan. But we have a part to play in that plan as well. And Paul's very confused and deeply hurt why the Jews seem to be not coming along in the faith like he would like them to. But Paul is convinced that God will redeem them all in the end. And so, yeah, it's... It's complex. It's interesting. And it doesn't function as a systematic theology the way we want it to, oftentimes. No, because the Bible is not a systematic theology reference book. Hmm. You can keep going. Well, uh, okay, so it's, they're supposed to be written by the apostles themselves, but it's more interesting than that. 
So, the first letter, first apostolic letter in the New Testament, Romans. How does it begin? Who's it written by? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle to all who are in Rome. And you're reading the whole letter through, and you're like, okay, this is Paul's voice. And nobody debates that. There's actually not any skeptical scholar on the planet who thinks that the book of Romans doesn't come from Paul. The last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, it's a greeting list. It's, it's wonderful. You'll get there sometime in September or something like that, right? And uh, it's literally like he's never been to Rome. He wants to get there, but he knows lots of people there. And so it's a whole chapter of be like, oh, say hi to Phoebe. And I, uh, Priscilla is going to come by soon. And like, it's this whole thing of like saying hi to different people. Here's how the last paragraph reads. This is so great. So he says, Timothy, my coworker. Oh yeah, he sends his greetings to you. Oh yeah, so to Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter. I, hello, hi, it's me too. <laughs> oh yeah, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, send you his greetings. Erastus, he's the city's director of public works. Our brother Cortus. Right? So you've read through this whole letter. You're going, oh, this is, I'm hearing Paul. And you are hearing Paul, but you're hearing Paul mediated through whose technical scribal expertise? Tertius. Isn't this great? Are you with me here? There's no scandal here. There's no, like, it's, he's very, you know, like, did you think he wrote this without Paul's permission? <laughs> no, there's no, like, this is how you write letters, right? If Paul's in prison, he's whatever. He, he, so we know that some letters, he at least wrote some sections. In Galatians, he says, look, I'm so ticked at the Galatians because they're treating each other so horribly. He's like, I write this conclusion with my own letters, he says at the end of that one. But here he, he let Tertius say hi. So no scandal here. No scandal. Um, for, first, and this one's actually really significant. So the letter of First Peter, same thing. You read the first sentence. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So those who live in resident aliens all, aliens all throughout Pontus, Galatia, all these different areas in, in Asia Minor. You get to the end of the letter and you read this. By means of Sylvanus, who I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly. So it's Peter's voice, but he's telling you, listen, you're hearing my words and teaching through this letter, through the scribal work of, of Sylvanus. And this, this is really interesting, and this is why this is an important example. Who's Peter? Peter's he was a fisherman from up in Galilee, from up in the you know, boondocks, up in the sticks. We know he didn't get a, a proper synagogue education because it was held against him throughout his career that he wasn't an educated man. And the, the, the Greek of First Peter is beautiful, flowing, flowing literary Greek. It's like high style Greek. And so, so how on earth does an uneducated Galilean fisherman produce a high style work of literary Greek? Through Sylvanus. So what, what First Peter is, we're hearing a faithful representation of the voice of Peter, of the, of the teaching of Peter. Who, what did Peter actually say to him? It's a divine and human word, right? Peter was with Jesus, he heard him. He, ha you know, and he, he knows about these, these here in First Peter, it's these church communities that are under fire, they're under persecution. And so he starts talking to Silvanus. Here's what I want these people to hear. And Silvanus uh, translates all of that into flowing literary Greek. And it's called the letter of First Peter. It's a divine and human word. How you guys doing? Okay, we're almost, we're almost, almost there to land the plane. So we have the, the apostolic letter. Pause. I gotta grab something. Okay. Skip this forward to the next timestamp, by the way. Okay. If we want a modern example of something like this, um, Francis Chan's book, Racing Hell, is not a bad one. It's a fine book, although they take a um, eternal conscious torment view. Although Preston Sprinkle, the guy that has uh, co-wrote this with him, um, now does not no longer now is an annihilationist, which is interesting. <clears throat> In the preface, Chan says this. I wrote this book with my friend Preston. I recruited his help because he can interact with issues at a deeper level than I can. His expertise in language, history, and the New Testament has helped tremendously in our effort to be thorough and precise. Preston studied first century Judaism for his doctorate and has published many works in the area. We thought it would be a good partnership because we have different gifts but similar convictions as we wrote the book 
we decided to write it with one voice, Francis's. Truth be told, the majority of research was done by Preston. While Preston and I wrote this book, it could not have been completed without the meticulous help of many in our community. And then he goes on for a paragraph to list a bunch of people. And then he says, however, no matter how many human filters we solicit to purify the words of this book, it's still fallible. Because of this, we have included many direct quotes from scripture. Read the scriptures we've quoted, we've quoted as truth directly from the mouth of God. That's an interesting phrase. Pause and meditate deeply on the verses wherever they arise. Those words are ultimately what God wants you to cherish and embrace. But I think that phrase that he was interesting. As we wrote this book, we decided to write it with one voice, Francis's. But truth be told, the majority of the research was done by Preston. Okay, so who wrote this book? Yeah. A bunch of people, apparently. Yeah, well, every paper that I've ever written for seminary was primarily me. But Bethany edited I'd have her proofread it to make sure that I didn't have commas in the wrong place or use too many that's. Those are my most common errors. Yeah. Um, but there are others. She'll be like, hey, this sentence makes no sense the way you've written it. And I'll be like, oh, shoot. Okay, well, here, let me go change that. And I could, you know, in a byline say edited by Bethany, right? But it, that... And if it was a published work, I would 100% do that, right? But it was primarily me. It's all of my thoughts and ideas mediated through a sifting that my wife participates in, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't see why we should expect anything necessarily different. I mean, that, that's been our thesis the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. Is why do we expect something different to be true of the way the Bible was written, compiled, edited, and constructed holistically? Right? Just because it has this special status that I believe it does, does not mean that God did not use people and the way people normally function to bring it about. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think quite often God does use regular people and the way regular people function to bring about his will in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that's the whole point of this thing, actually. So why is the Bible any different? You have anything to add? No, I just wanted to read that preface yeah. real quick just to, again, it's no different. It yeah. is no different. Yeah. Well, and so I guess one, one more quick thing before we move on is um, I think it's really important to see that the Bible is not hiding the ball on that. Yeah. Right. Tim it's, keeps saying it's no scandal and it's not yeah. because it's right there. It's literally right there. And the fact that most Christians don't know that only proves further our ignorance of the Bible itself, not what the Bible actually is, mm -hmm. right? And that, I think, is the real scandal, is yeah. the fact that I could probably say that to someone, and it would really shake their faith, and it's not a scandal at all. Like, I know some people that if I started messing with their perceptions of authorship as they currently stand. It would really do some damage. And I wouldn't want to do any damage, but I want to get them to the point where they're okay having that conversation because I don't think that's a safe place to be in your faith, right? That's, that's not good. That's really not good. So anyway, I guess we'll continue. I just quick note, I skipped ahead a little bit, not that the sections that we skipped are bad, but I think that this next section is a bit more relevant. And we've already talked about some of the stuff that he was going to say. Yeah, that one right there. So here's, again, uh, Henry Gamble. Uh, you know, he wouldn't say, I'm a follower of Jesus. He grew up in a Christian tradition. He's a critical scholar. He's one of the authoritative sources on the making and the formation of the New Testament. And this is what he that's what this section is on is this similar thing, how he ended the old Testament section with, okay, how did it all come together? 
we're about to do the same thing with the New Testament. He has to say, the New Testament was not self-consciously created by the church, either as a response to some external pressures, which we'll consider in a second, or as a means to some end. It arose naturally and spontaneously from the inner life of early Christianity, above all in the context of worship and instruction. Do you get it? Yeah. So, so, so when, for, like leading scholar on the formation of the New Testament, any secret council of politically motivated theologians, ah, I know what we'll do. We'll get everybody in the world to believe in this guy we made up. You know, you know like just, that's just so not where the evidence leads you. What it leads you is to something that's messy, and that is the Jesus movement. It's the organic spreading of these communities that keep spreading because people hear about Jesus and they encounter his presence in these communities and they're transformed and they're like, I'm all in for this guy. And then all of a sudden they get the writings of the apostles and the, and the Torah and the prophets and it's all clicking together for them. And then, you know, man, I have some friends down the road in that town, they need to know. And so it spreads over there and oh, we need to copy more writings and they need more. And that's how, that's how the writing of, of the apostles, the Torah, prophets, Jesus and the apostles, it's like the, um, my analogy is that they went viral, quite literally. It's those writings that rose to the top. Everybody wants to read them. All these new churches need them. They get copied and copied and recopied, collected and collected and collected. It's a very complex process, but the idea is very simple, isn't it? Like you get it. It's not that, it's not that complicated. And none of the evidence points to a secret group doing this in some corner. If it was a secret group doing it in some corner, the evidence of what early Christianity is actually doing would not look like what it is. You guys with me on that point? Okay, now I kind of have to uh, skip and that's okay. Oh yeah, but not this quote because it's really good. <laughs> all right. So this is, uh, this is good, J leave it to J.R. Packer who is a Christian theologian, but he is looking at all this evidence and this is what he says, the church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. Do you get his point there? So Newton didn't obviously create gravity. He pointed out and he's like, everybody, do you see what this, the apple and so on, this whole thing? So the whole point is that no one needed to argue for the authority and the power of these documents. They were the documents connected to Jesus and the apostles, and they just happened to the early church. And they're the documents that got copied and recopied and recopied and recopied. They're the, precisely the documents that are connected to the apostles. And they're what, you, what we have in the formation of the New Testament. Did it take time as the church spread? And you know, you have, you have believers up here in Rome, and you have people down here in Carthage and North Africa. I mean, think about the geographical spread here. Right? This is going to take time for all of this to spread out. But, but it's precisely these writings that rose to the top. The writings that did not rise to the top were these. <laughs> and Dan Brown, we have Dan Brown to thank um, for this idea that somehow there were actually all these other versions of the life of Jesus and all of these other writings of the apostles uh, that were floating around and that were originally in the Bible. And then some crew of old politically motivated theologians got together and said, no, we take those out because we don't like that. You guys with me here? That's, this, that's a dominant narrative about the formation of the Bible. And I'll, just two minutes of thought. Why do you think that some writings about Jesus ended up lost, forgotten, and buried in the sands of Egypt for 2,000 years, where others were never lost because they were being constantly read and reread and reread and recopied because precisely those are the writings connected to the actual apostles and what Jesus actually said. Are you with me here? These books were never taken out of the Bible because they were never, they was never even entertained that they would be a part of the apostolic testimony in the first place. And I, I don't know, I don't know what to say about this because you watch the History Channel and it's just like, you know what I'm saying? I don't, where do they get it? I actually don't know where they get this idea. Maybe it, you know, they want to smoke pot and sleep with their girlfriend. And so like, okay, so like, I don't want to live under the authority of the Bible. And I conveniently find a historical theory that makes me, makes that okay. And I'll be okay with my conscience. I mean, I'm being quite serious about that. It's very easy to accept a narrative about the Bible that's convenient for the lifestyle that you want to live. And Jesus is, is anything but convenient for your lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he'll, he'll challenge every human to their very core. 
And it's precisely these writings connected to the apostles that do that and have been doing that to God's people for millennia now. And there's no secret society that did this. It's a public event whose history we can trace. One concluding quote, and then we're good. Uh, Michael Kruger's excellent, excellent book on the history of the formation of the canon. Uh, it's worth, it's, wor it's, a, it's boring. <laughs> but you'll learn a ton. And here's, um, here's uh, his summary. He says, the canon was never authorized or mandated by any general council of the ancient church. It rather rested on the early and largely informal consensus of the church. And we're talking about the centuries before, like, the ca and there's any centralized power centers in Rome or Constantinople. It's just a broad international multi-ethnic movement where these writings have risen to the top. That's what he means by informal. In short, the church did not close the canon because it never started it to begin with. The canon was inherited from the apostles. Pause. To every single point that I've made, there are footnotes. Did you want to, I saw you pick some up. Did you want to read it? Because I had, I emailed you something. Yes, I saw the email. Um, I wanted to make a couple of points because that last thing that he said, um, I think this is goes really... directly with the last two comments he made. The video. Okay. Said. Okay, cool. Um, so something on Nicaea, right? Because a lot of people point to Nicaea and he actually, there's a Q&A session after that. You probably noticed the video is a lot longer um, than we're going to go. That's the end of the official talk. He has a Q&A. There's a question about Nicaea. He addresses this there. It's the same thing that my, funnily enough, um, Marxist history of Christianity professor also says, right? So you'd expect him to be kind of critical or whatever, but he says the same thing, at least the, the traditional Christian would expect him to be critical, right? He says the same thing, that the canon arose naturally over time um, out of a community that recognized a certain section of documents. The book that I picked up, I'm not actually going to read from it because I haven't actually read it, though I heard the author speak in person. Uh, her name's Elaine Pagel. Um, she wrote the Gnostic Gospels. Um, and she is a big proponent of the Gnostic Gospels needing to be further integrated into Christian teaching. Um, she does not think that they contradict most of what we consider to be canon in any substantial way. Um, and so I need to do some, I need to read it and I need to do some more research, but just based off of her talk, I think it's fair to say that she has some good points. Um, she also seems to argue that there was some kind of patriarchal power play at stake in, in the formation of the canon. I don't think that that holds much water, personally. My history of Christianity professor would also not suggest that that holds much water. So would a number of scholars. Um, I think that her perspective is primarily motivated by the, her own way she relates to the canon and then the way she relates to the Gnostic Gospels. Though I would actually probably agree that the Gnostic Gospels have some interesting and good things to consider. Um, and I look forward to one day reading the book, hopefully this summer, though likely I won't get to it because of a long list of books I wanna cover this summer. So I, I think that it at least bears recognizing that there are contradictory opinions in scholarship yep, and that those opinions are not necessarily ill-founded. Um, I'd need to do a bit more research into it in order to make greater judgments, but I tend to lean more towards Tim's side of the um, equation and my teacher, um, my history of Christianity professor, um, who presented this very well in our class with a lot of good points of argumentation. Um, the point on Nicaea, just briefly, um, is that the canon was established to, in reference to what texts could be authoritatively referenced when talking about other issues, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted a canon of established texts. That way they could have arguments about other things. The point was never what is and isn't authoritative. We have lists of canons going way back, and we have um, the early church fathers referencing 
a number of texts, very rarely, if ever, do they reference a Gnostic gospel as authoritative in any way, shape, or form. And I would be interested to see how um, Dr. Pagel references and deals with that issue in and of itself. Um, so I'll pull up this other video. You just you created the perfect it. transition, by the way. Okay, great. So um, yeah, you go. So uh, when you either, I would say after you read um, Dr. What's her name? Uh, Elaine Pagel. Dr. Pagel's book. Listen to this six hour lecture. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, What's the timestamp? The first one you can go to is about 45 We'll play maybe a minute. He's kind of introing the things he's going to talk about for for a bit and then go to about 54, 54, okay. 30. Um, I'm getting a um, an ad real quick. Give me a second. Okay. But um, so that you're aware of why I'm, I'm, I make that joke, although it's not really a joke. Um, this is Heiser's talk. It's an early talk, at least as far as his career, of what we know of him now. Um, and you'll notice that by his outfit and his yeah. hair um because he's got a full beard going on but um this was a look that i personally yeah, that was a this is a lecture he gave over i think a whole day or maybe two days but it got turned into a dvd and then posted on the internet and it's heiser's response to christian narcissism Gnosticism as made popular by Dan Brown. So he references Da Vinci Code a lot. Interesting. That's kind of how it was marketed. And he's not necessarily, although he references the Da Vinci Code, and we'll see that here in a second, he's mainly going after the people that Dan Brown uses as references for yeah. his views of canon and the Bible. And yeah. he goes very hard against the textuality of Gnosticism being anything. Yeah on the level of the Bible or even considered in the time period in which most people believe it to be. Yeah. And then the story that Gnosticism tells, he sees as anti, anti Jewish and anti Christian. Yeah. So okay. interesting. He spends the first, so just so you're aware, well, I'm skipping so far ahead. He spends the first session, the first 30 to 40 minutes, just retelling the Gnostic story as it gets systematized, he yeah. gives you that world, and then he tells you about some of the canonization issues yeah. that Gnosticism has, as yeah. far as the arguments Dan Brown wants to make about the Bible. Yeah. So if you want to go ahead and play that first part about 45 or, yeah, 45 minutes. Okay. Play like one or two minutes and then skip ahead about 10. Okay. Um, you'll have to let me know if I'm exactly where you want me or, um, yeah, does this look about right? Yeah. Me tell you that and walk away thinking, oh, that's nice. Why do people say that? Well, there's actually evidence for that. Three non-technical points for today are the Gospels, all of them, or at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke, prophesy the destruction of the temple. He's talking about, he's making some arguments for earlier dates of gospel, of the Gospels being written. Interesting. And not even outside of the bounds of what Tim was discussing, but yeah, why this, you can't see my cursor, but why before about 150, you can argue that most of the Gospels either were around or had, there was something about them that was there. And I would say even most of the New Testament canon before about 200. So, and he'll make that argument later. But yeah. right now he's talking about this gap in between the Gospels, the New Testament Gospels and Acts, and then the Gnostic Gospels. So he, he's talking about canonization at the moment. Interesting. In other words, there's a prediction. Jesus makes predictions about the temple being destroyed. That happened in 70 AD. Everybody on the planet knows that, okay? However, none of the Gospels mention its fulfillment. So the presumption is that they were written prior to the fulfillment of the prophecy because nobody mentions it. And that was a big deal in Judaism, a huge deal. Sorry to pause again, but I actually, that's the first time that I've heard this argument made, like legitimately. First time I've heard this argument made because I've typically 
swam in more of the the pools that would argue for later. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I necessarily agree with that. I actually think they're a lot earlier than most of the people around me would say. Um, but I'd never heard that. And I think that's actually a really good point is if you're trying to argue for the divinity of Jesus. Now you, you could say, right, that every, it was so widely known that no one needed to mention it, mm-hmm. but you would expect, I feel like one of the gospels to say, Hey, and this was fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of a, a selling point of the prophecy. Yeah. So I don't know. And um, N.T. Wright talks about how the sacking of the temple doesn't happen how Luke says it's going to happen. It just happens. And so, so, so like the troops don't approach from the same side. They don't like there are certain things from the historical accounts we have that don't match up with Luke's prediction of it happening. And mm-hmm. so he uses that to argue that Luke's prediction had to be written earlier mm-hmm. than the sacking because it actually doesn't match exactly, mm-hmm. which I think is fascinating too, because then it's like, oh, well, is, is this prediction, it obviously happened like it was predicted or that it was predicted and it happened. Mm-hmm but it didn't happen as it was predicted exactly. So then there's like, how much is God involved? How much mm-hmm. is man involved um, with this not being predicted? What, is it inspired then? Yada, yada, yada. I mean, you can spiral down, right? But I think it's interesting because it kind of lends itself towards proving some authenticity for this. Anyway, sorry. Luke never mentions the death of Paul and Peter in either his gospel or its sequel, the book of Acts. We know from external sources that Paul died in the late 60s, 66, 67 AD. The the book of Acts ends before his death, and Luke was written prior to Acts, so there you go. Do the math. Manuscript evidence. This is called the Rylands Papyrus. It is the oldest manuscript piece, manuscript in any size of the New Testament. And it dates to roughly the 130s, the 140s, something like that. It is from John 18, 31 to 33. This is when Jesus is in front of Pilate. I'm not going to translate the whole thing, but just so you know where it comes from. Uh, Therefore, Pilate said, uh, said to them, Take him, you all take him, and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, We are not authorized to put to death anyone. And they said that in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which spoke of the type of death that he would die and so on and so forth. But the red are the letters that show up in this papyrus. And so this is what papyrologists and New Testament paleographical experts do. They'll take a scrap, and now, especially with the use of computers, you can find where the matches are in a document. Okay? This is the oldest one. Now, if this manuscript dates to the 130s, the original, logically, let's put our thinking caps on, logically would have been prior to the 130s. Okay? Again, why doesn't Brown or his sources go into this? They either don't know it, which isn't good if you're writing, especially if you're claiming to write nonfiction, or they don't want you to know, which is probably worse. Do we have any other hard evidence that the New Testament Gospels are older than the oldest Nag Hammadi material? What about the rest of the New Testament? Well, the answer is, yeah, we do. Very simply, early church fathers, early church writers quote the New Testament. Like, what else would they quote? (laughs) They're doing sermons, they're doing commentaries, they're writing theologies. They're quoting the New Testament. And we know when these guys live because of Roman records. Okay, we know when they lived. We know when Barnabas, we know, you know, we know all these, these figures, their dates and everything else. So when they quote something, it fixes a date for that quotation. The thing they're quoting must have existed prior to the quotation. This is simple, coherent logic that apparently escapes Brown's sources. Or again, they just don't want you to know. The Epistle of Barnabas, there are the dates 70 to 79, quotes Matthew and Mark. The Didache quotes Matthew extensively, and that's between 70 and 130. 
Luke and John are both quoted in what's called the Muratorian Fragment. Again, 170 to 180. There are external methods of dating too. Paleographical analysis, carbon-14, whatnot. Polycarp, there are his, these are his life dates, 69 to 155, lived a long life. He was a convert of the Apostle John, you know, the John, quotes the book of Acts in his own epistle to the Philippians. The shepherd of Hermas quotes Acts several times. There you have the dates. The epistles of Paul. Romans is cited by Clement of Rome a lot. There are his dates. He's also cited, Romans is cited by Polycarp in the Didache. 1 Corinthians is cited in the Didache and the shepherd of Hermas. So is 2 Corinthians and also by Polycarp. Galatians is cited by Polycarp and Diognetius. Ephesians and Colossians by Polycarp, Clement, and Ignatius. There you have Ignatius' dates. Philippians is cited again by Polycarp. You, get, you see a pattern emerging? What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through every book of the New Testament. Every book of the New Testament is quoted in a source earlier than the oldest Gnostic material at all. Every one of them, without exception. Epistles of Paul, more of them, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy and Titus, again cited by Clement, the Didache. Ignatius makes allusions to the personal letter of Philemon. There's a debate whether that's an actual quotation or an allusion, but an allusion you know, works for our purposes. The book of Hebrews is cited frequently by Clement. James also, 1st and 2nd Peter, cited by Clement. 1st John, the shepherd of Hermas. 2nd John by Polycarp and other sources, and the book of Revelation, cited by Hermas and Justin Martyr, whose date is 160. Every book in the New Testament is quoted by somebody before any Gnostic gospel was written. I'm not talking the translation was written. Now, the only possible exception among the Gnostic material is the gospel of Thomas. Thomas might be roughly contemporary with some of the later Gospels, but that is the only one, and there's debate over that. But I'm, I'm telling you because there's debate on it. Okay? And by the way, the Gospel of Thomas, if you, um, again, a lot of this scholarly material is really expensive and you have to be near a library to get a hold of it. But there are, you know what a harmony of the Gospels is? When okay, you take can the pause Gospels, it. the four of them. That's mainly, that's what I wanted. Yeah, that was good. So just making Tim's point again in a little bit different way, proving the textuality of the gospel's existence and the New Testament's existence in in the very least written form because of its quotations by church fathers. But also within that is the implication that it is seen as authoritative. Otherwise, why would you quote it for those you're writing to? Sorry, guys, I had to cut this one short. That was part two of Daniel and I's discussion on the canonization of the New Testament. The start of part one with the Gospels, this one with the Apostolic Letters. Seeing how they came about, seeing how they were defined as authoritative to the community, and how they rose up to be part of the New Testament, and then the biblical canon. So, this next week, for part three, Daniel and I go on a tangential discussion about canonization as such how things get canonized not just in the bible but in broader culture what does that mean and how does it connect to the canonization of the bible itself it's a very interesting discussion and one that i'm very excited to share with you guys so i'll see you in that one